Diamond Valley Writers Guild this morning. It's a pleasure to have everyone and to see everyone. And uh, we have an exciting guest speaker this morning, Clay Stafford. Happy to have him. He's coming to us from Kentucky. Nashville. And, oh, I'm sorry. I'm in the wrong state. Well, <laughs> maybe, maybe I'm in the wrong state. Maybe. I'm <laughs> anyway, the. the uh, it's nice to be among writers, and uh, I mentioned before to the uh, Zoom group, uh, they're creative people, and it's always wonderful to be with creative people. Uh, this morning I was uh, thinking about the meeting, and I noticed we're called the Diamond Valley, Diamond Valley Writers Guild. We're not called authors, which is something I like. You know, it, it's a very active uh, name. We're writers. Authors, I'm never quite sure, you know, what they do, but writers, you know, have to be sitting down somewhere writing something. And this group does. We're very productive, and I'm happy to say that. And uh, we have a lot of people who we'll hear from, hopefully, this morning, who uh, can share their writing, what they've been doing. Um, I want to mention that uh, we're still looking for backup for the technical broadcast coming from the library. If anybody has an interest in that, please contact Michelle. And also, um, last time we announced we are looking to have a, a Zoom, not a Zoom, a, uh, a Guild logo. And so if any artists out there want to submit something, I'm sure uh, the board will be happy to look at it. Um, okay, I'll turn it over to uh, Michelle now to uh, discuss membership. Michelle? Let me get to the podium because you can't see me. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Good morning. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thank you so much for those of you who have renewed or joined um, the Guild in the last couple of weeks. Our membership numbers are coming up nicely. Um, we do have a goal that we haven't hit yet for this year. Um, it's $25 to join the Guild. It is not mandatory in order to participate in our meetings. We decided a long time ago we just wanted people to be in a community of writers and be able to interrelate with one another. Um, so I'm going to put in the chat in a few minutes ways that you can join if you'd like. It helps us bring these meetings to everybody because equipment is expensive and uh, websites are expensive and all of that. So thank you so much. Okay, well, thank you, Michelle. And uh, now we'll. Um, I'll introduce uh, Cheryl McGuire from Straight Jackets Magazine. We have uh, three wonderful ladies who are editors of the magazine. We have Ellen Wolf, we have Cheryl McGuire, and our newest editor is Sandy Schuster Hubbard. And they do a wonderful job. And uh, Cheryl, are you there? I am. Okay. So I want to thank everybody. We had, uh, because we didn't do a fall issue last year, we had quite a few uh, submissions for this spring issue and we had to make some hard choices. Um, but we have some, some, we just, they were all great. We got, so um, it went live. The magazine went live yesterday. There was a glitch in the, in the, um, in it yesterday, but now that should be fixed. So please email me if somebody still can't get in. Um, Karen, I got your message. Uh, and uh, Ellen, she's the Ellen's back in Boston, so we're going to work on it. But I did get it. I just wanted to acknowledge that. And uh, anyway, um, the new deadline um, for fall um, 23 is going to be October 1. And you can send in submissions whenever you like. I just check in to the email uh, site um, to... Um, um, and I save them so so you can send when you like. And what is our? I never look at our email address. Does it, what is it, Michelle? Do you know off the top of your head, or I gotta look because I just open it up. It's dvwritersguild at gmail dot com. No, no, no. It's um the straight jackets one. Oh shoot, it's um. I'll look it up and put it in the chat. Oh, thank you, thank you. Okay, yeah, it's just. 
automatic for me, so I never have it memorized. But um, anyway, so um, if you have any questions, also you can send questions to that same email that, that she's going to put in the chat. And thank you, everybody, for participating in the magazine. It's great. Thank you. I, I just want to say a few brief words about the magazine. I always like to crow about it. And uh, I have to give credit to uh, Jim Hitt, our past president, for starting the magazine. And he always, uh, I always leave him out. And he, I shouldn't, because he did a great job in starting a great magazine. And I wanted to acknowledge that. And then uh, Ellen and the gang took over after uh, Jim passed it on. And I looked at this month's issue. I was so delighted to see how many articles there were. And all of them were interesting and good. So it, it was just a pleasure. And the artwork is just wonderful. And uh, Vicki Hitt started the artwork in, in the original version of the magazine. I wanted to acknowledge her. Her covers were always beautiful. And uh, so we've kept up that tradition. And I want to thank Jim and Vicki for their efforts in starting the magazine. And, for our current uh, editorial staff for continuing it in the manner in which it, it happens. So thank you. Okay, let's move on to um, members' recent publications and successes. Would anybody like to share their recent publications and or successes? I guess there haven't been any. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Everyone okay. must have taken a vacation. Must be. There must be. There actually, must be. actually, I'll I'll mention my success is getting my first novel that I mentioned last meeting got published in a literary journal for the first time called Straight Jackets. All right. Well, congratulations. So thank you very much. And what was the article about? Uh, it's after it's actually the afterword from my book. It's called Breadcrumbs. And it's it's really just a, a, a thought, more of a philosophical thought pattern, just uh, one or two pages worth uh, for the whole book, kind of a sum up of the thought process. Mm -hmm. Oh, very good. OK, Howard. Hey, Karen, go ahead. Um, well, I published another story in Substack on my husband's sleeping habits, which has gotten lots of laughs and lots of reads. I, I want to put in a pitch again for Substack. It's so much fun to just have a little, a little funny thing to throw on there and then to see that hundreds of people are reading it. And knowing that <laughs> that many people probably haven't read my books. So I, I thank Howard for getting that started for me and helping me do that. And uh, I thank Straight Jackets for publishing my poem on retirement. So everything counts, folks. Come on, you guys. I know that you've been writing lately. Okay. Well, thank you, Karen. Anybody else? Oh, I raised my hand. You don't no, see it. I don't there. Now I see it. That's a nice hand. Okay. <laughs> you can read my palm if you want. Uh, no, since we're counting straight jackets, which we should, I wasn't mentally. Um, I believe, Cheryl, uh, you can uh, verify this because I haven't opened it yet, but I believe a poem of mine was published in there. Is that right, Cheryl? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's an achievement. All right. And what was the title of your poem? I knew you were going to ask that. What was it, Cheryl? I, I uh, submitted it last writing, year. Writing so. in the night or something like that? Yeah, yeah. Something like that. Words in the night. Words in yeah, the night. Yeah, it, it's, it's about words that come to me uh, when I'm asleep. All right. <laughs> Any pictures with those words? No, I take that back, Dan. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? That's the Howard I know from the critique group. 
Well, I don't have any successes, but in my bio on the magazine, it talks about my obsessive taking of UCLA writing classes. And I've been out of them for a few years, but I'm back in. I can't, I can't, I don't know what it is about taking writing classes that I just keep on keeping on. So. Well, that's interesting because you can never know enough. And I, I Evidently. Agree with you. Yeah, no, it's true. And the things come up that surprise you even after years that, you know, right. you see somebody else doing and you say, well, hey, that's a good idea. Let me try that. So it, it always pays to listen and to learn. I always like that. I don't know if uh, my friend Jerry Prager is here, but uh, he started writing on Substack and he has uh, a wonderful series of books. It's a, a, a noir book, uh, a noir series but with uh, humor and uh, you know if you if you have a chance to look at that um, no, please do and I, this uh, first chapter of this first book is uh, it's on Substack and his name is P-R-A-G-E-R -E and it's called it's called Losers Gallery and uh, that'll give you a little taste of what he's about a very talented writer Anybody else? Kevin, what are you up to? Well, uh, oh. still writing, but uh, I guess I have had a milestone is that my ongoing space opera that I've been writing and serial publishing is now past the half million word mark. Wow. What's a, what's a space opera? It's just an ongoing science fiction story that just uh, it started off on a dare and i just it took on a life of its own and i think i've had just over two million reads on it so far but wow it's it's just published for free and mm -hmm. it's actually the it's basis of my first two books which is the cowboy and the aliens and the king of atlantis oh, very nice and where where can somebody see that uh stories online sci-fi stories.com um i can't remember where else all the links are on my personal website so kevin okay. kindle.com <laughs> okay okay and that's all one word right okay i'm gonna howard can i can i just add something um you forgot to mention the audiobook that i posted alongside okay. yeah just yeah if, thank if you there Jerry. are people out there that don't like to read yeah, they just want to hear. Listen, to listen. You can and, listen to my book too. Yeah. And, and I listened to the first chapter that he posted as the audio, and it was wonderful. It, well, the, it, it's by Brian Callanan, is the uh, narrator. He's an award winning uh, narrator. Yeah. So, and apparently he does all the voices too. He's great. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and you really feel you're in the noir setting with, with that. You know, it, it, it's amazing on audio to have that feeling. Howard, Judy had her hand up. Hey, thank you, Karen. Judy? Yeah, I, I had my hand up, but I didn't have my, my mute. I was muted, so I couldn't yell. Hi, everybody. I just thought I'd drop in for a while. It's been a long time. Jerry, nice. I wonder how your books are going. And everybody, it's nice to see everybody. Um, and as far as publishing, I'm publishing. I sent my book to the uh, publisher my eighth book called Activate Love Mode. So, ooh, ooh. <laughs> so anyway, but that's what I've been doing. I'm up in, I live in Oregon now and, um, and on the coast and having a great time. But it's so cool. I missed, I have missed you guys over the years. So I just wanted to say hi. No, hi. <laughs> nice Judy, to see you. Judy, I didn't you. recognize you without your hat. Yeah, I know. I thought I should go back in and get my hat, but I said, oh, I was just too lazy to do that. Hi, Daniel. <laughs> okay. Any, anybody else have their hand raised who I'm not and, seeing? And your cat. Yeah. Um, he. Uh, I got a new kitten. A new kitten. Yeah, I, I, knew, I knew Sportster had passed, and I, yeah, yeah, but he's, you usually have some kind of cat with you. Yeah, he might come around later. I don't know. <laughs> His name is Sneaker Wave uh, because he has to have a coastal name now uh, living on the coast, you know, so. I don't know if you can change a cat's name. 
Oh, this is a new cat. This oh, okay. Is a new cat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anybody they don't else? answer to anything anyway, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, anybody else have something they'd like to share? Howard knows the rules for everything, even naming cats. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, we'll move on now to writing tips and the wonderful Sandy Schuster Hubbard. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I am not at my best this morning, guys. Uh, I'm on pain meds for my little broken wing and I can only hunt and peck with my left hand to type things out. So uh, between those two things, I'm not at my best. I did want to put in a plug first for uh, the VoucherCon 2023, the World Mystery Convention. This year, it's going to be in San Diego. So if you have any interest, it brings together readers, writers, publishers, editors, agents, booksellers, and lovers of crime fiction. So it's four days of education, entertainment, and fun, and they have some pretty good swag. You get a great bag and a t-shirt, and you get to choose from hundreds of books there, uh, five that you want to have. And they have signings and whatnot. So it's being held at the Marriott Marquis San Diego Marina. Uh, it's $230 for the four days. And David Baldacci, CJ Box, uh, uh, Kate Carlisle, and Ann Cleves are some of the keynoters, uh, along with hundreds of other writers on panels and sharing things. And that is from August 30th to September 2nd. I'm signed up. I hope you will be too, because it'd be fun to have some of you there. Uh, I want to talk about scene this morning. Uh, we all know that scene's a passage of fiction in which a character attempts to achieve a short-term goal that he or she hopes will bring them closer to achieving the whole story goal. The short-term goal is a scene in a scene is called the scene goal, oddly enough. Uh, every scene should have a specific goal more than simply moving the plot forward. Some things uh, a scene can accomplish, you can reveal character uh, through dialogue, you can plant clues or red herrings, you can foreshadow later developments or explore or develop themes. If you're a planner before writing, write down your specific purposes. Or in my case, I am much more of a pantser. Uh, before revising your scene, read, uh, read your draft and write down its purpose after the fact. And if it's not clear, then you can uh, make sure that you add those uh, uh, that element in. Then focus on character. What does your character want? Then you can supply an action that moves them toward their goals. So uh, scenes dramatize, so you don't do a lot of telling or explaining. You use the dialogue that contains some conflict or resistance. Robert McKee, uh, he, he's a script writer, but I very much appreciate uh, everything he says applies to both fiction and narrative nonfiction. And he says each scene should have a change. If it begins in a positive way, there should be a change toward the negative and vice versa. If it begins in a negative vein, should move to positive. Now, these don't always have to be huge uh, changes uh, and conflicts, but there needs to be some. Uh, evocative dialogue can then deliver a, a twist or a turn and some surprises for the reader. Sometimes the tension is more subtle, but readers sense trouble is brewing as in subtext. Short scenes tend to focus on plot and action. Longer scenes tend to focus on setting and character. Scene length depends on style, voice, and pacing. Short scenes tend to increase the pace 
and longer scenes slow down the pace, but both are needed. You want to end your scenes suspensefully, make the reader want to read the next line, leave something left unsaid, whether in character's mind or in a conversation with another character. Each scene must lead to the next. Scenes are like falling dominoes, each triggering the next until the final domino falls. In, you might want to end a scene with a question that must be answered or foreshadowing subsequent action or introducing a plot twist. And I'd like to uh, read you a little section from a book written uh, like 23 years ago by Raymond Obstefeld, F-E-L-D, uh, Crafting Scenes. And uh, he says, still can't decide whether or not the scene you've just written belongs in your story. Here's help. Read the scene again. And when you're finished, complete the following sentences. Number one, the plot focus. The purpose of this scene is to fill in your blanks. He offers as an example, the purpose of this scene is to reveal the protagonist's childhood abuses in order to provide motivation for her current actions. Number two, the character focus. When the reader finishes this scene, he should feel, fill in the blanks, his example offered when the reader finishes this scene, he should feel sympathy for the protagonist, yet be skeptical of her reliability as a narrator. Number three, the theme focus. When the reader finishes the scene, he should think. Example, when the reader finishes this scene, he should think that the protagonist has been using these abuses as an excuse for many and other self-destructive actions. And number four, when the reader finishes this scene, he should wonder. Example, when the reader finishes this scene, he should wonder whether or not the protagonist will be able to overcome the horror of her childhood in order to reignite with the estranged mother. And the final word I'd like to leave you with on scene is a scene is like a single member of a family. It is loved for its own individuality, but its greatest power is its contribution to the larger group. Sandy, can you give me the name of that book again and the author? Yes, uh, Novelist's Essential Guide to Crafting Scenes, uh, Raymond, R-A-Y-M-O-N-D, Obstfeld, O-B-S-T-F-E-L-D. Okay. Well, thank you, Sandy. And um, yep. um, could you spell Bochercon or whatever? Oh, uh, B-O-U-C-H-E-R-C-O-N. Uh, it's named after Anthony Voucher, who was uh, a critic, a writer and, uh, of crime fiction, and I believe he also won the Edgar in some of his uh, work. But it is, a voucher con is just great fun. So I hope some of you will uh, uh, have the opportunity to go or take the opportunity to go. Okay, well, thank you. And I hope the arm's healing well. Well, I'm certainly learning how everything is connected to my dominant arm. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for your writing tips this morning. And uh, I do want to mention our uh, director at large, Lynette Tucker, couldn't be here, but uh, she's in charge of shout outs. And if any of you have a, a book that's coming out or is out uh, recently, let her know and uh, she'll give you a, a shout out and uh, we'll go out to the world. So it's one of the nice things that the Guild does for its members. Okay, and uh, let me turn it over to Michelle now for the introduction of our guest speaker. 
Good morning, everybody, again. So Clay Stafford is an American best-selling and award-winning author, poet, screenwriter, and playwright, film and television producer, director, showrunner, actor, book, film, and stage reviewer, as well as public speaker. In other words, there's nothing that Clay can't do. That wasn't in his bio, I added that. He has sold nearly 4 million copies of his books and has his work distributed in 16 languages. He is founder and CEO of the annual Killer Nashville International Writers Conference and a contributor to Writers Digest magazine on with his online column, Killer Writer. So if you're a subscriber to, to Writers Digest, check out his article. Without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Clay. Just so you know, if you have questions or wanna say something, let me recognize you before you unmute mute so we don't step on each other. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Clay. Oh, I was able to, un I can't do everything because technology is beyond me. Um, I saw that it was muted and I was thinking that somebody else should unmute me <laughs> because I thought I was deliberately being shut out, but I see that I can do it myself. Um, my background, I'm, first of all, I want to thank everybody for showing up. I know there's a lot of things that you can be doing on a Saturday other than uh, sitting here listening to me chat. And, uh, and I want to say that I do like to chat. So if I'm talking and I'm not clear on something or it inspires a question, I'd love for you to interrupt me and uh, ask. And then because I'm more comfortable, especially in my when I teach college courses and, and other seminars, um, having a conversation rather than just doing a lecture, because at the, in the end of it all, it's all about what you get out of this, not what I have to say. It's about you. It's not about me. Um, as, as you know, I've got a background, um, as, as I mentioned, in numerous media. And I've also been an academic uh, and an educator. Um, I've created a, a, a program for Miami-Dade, an entire curriculum for Miami-Dade in Florida. And I, um, especially in film, TV, and live television, um, as a storyteller, I like to use um, one of uh, my old friend, Zig Ziglar, who was a uh, motivational speaker. Uh, he has a little thing that he said that uh, he's he uh, when I and I and I apply it to my writing itself because I grew up in an area where we were constantly concerned about commercials. People stream now and and binge now, and so you don't have the the commercial issue that you had before. But uh, I grew up with the idea that you uh, that you were like the one-eyed discus thrower. I don't know if you've ever heard Zig talk about this, the one-eyed discus thrower. I may not be very effective, but I do keep the crowd alert. And I do that through uh, incorporating elements of mystery, thr thriller, suspense, and romance as well. And so, um, like I said, if, as we go through this, if, there's, if you guys have uh, any any questions or anything, Michelle's going to, said she's going to be kind of the gate holder of, uh, uh, gatekeeper of um, you guys talking. And I really, I really do like the dialogue. Uh, what I'm gonna share with you, um, everybody has an opinion on uh, writing and I can only share what my opinion is. Some of it is going to be valid to you and some of it's not. And I'm not going to be, uh, and I appreciated Sandy's uh, bit on Robert McKee. Um, uh, that's an example. He's, he's very straightforward on what you should have in your work. And I am not necessarily that formal that you have to have this. I think every writer is different. I think every project is different. And I think that you need to just be able to uh, progress along with it the way that it, that the, the work calls and also the way that you work. So I'm going to share checklists. Some people like checklists, other people don't like checklists, but I, I love checklists myself because it keeps me organized. My brain is all over the place all the time. 
And if I don't have a checklist to go back and look at, then I will tend to forget something that's very important to me. So in my, this really wasn't the topic that we were going to talk about, but when I was talking to Michelle and we were just chatting, uh, I said, you know, every everything you write has elements of mystery, thriller, and suspense. And I left out romance, but it's got that as well. Um, mystery, thriller, and suspense. And, and she said, well, that's what we really want to talk about. So this is, uh, this is uh, basically, I think, getting down to the nitty gritty of every... Um, um, every everything that uh, every aspect every element of writing and I'm going to go through that and so I'm going to go through them quickly so if you have any because I only have a certain amount of time and I'm going to go through them quickly but if you do have questions please please ask um, but I think mystery thriller suspense and romance is important no matter what you write and we've got a wide variety I've talked to some of you some of you write plays some of you write uh, I, I know Michelle comes from a screenwriting uh, background or a family that's been in the production business, and uh, you write different kinds of genres, but even like a business or marketing proposal, uh, as well as any kind of literary classification, um, for example, I work in advertising as well, advertising campaign, campaigns can be called sexy Um Budweiser commercials are filled with suspense. Uh, poems, you know, they excite mystery. And so um, what we're talking about here can be used in any kind of writing except for, and my son just went to college, except for the five paragraph essay, which I think is going to be boring and trite no matter what in the world you're going to do with that thing, because I, I saw the prep on that. But um, Jokingly, the definition of mystery, thriller, suspense, and romance is whatever keeps the reader from turning the page or the viewer from changing the channels. So let's just look at, we're going to look at technique and not genre. We think of mystery, but I, I, don't, I want to get away from the genre itself and look at techniques. Killer Nashville, some people look at uh, the Killer Nashville International Writers Conference and they see uh, mystery, thriller, and suspense. What you, what some people miss at the very beginning are incorporating elements of mystery, thriller, and suspense because those are the things that uh, that keep you turning the page. The mystery, just so we're all pretty much defining, is something that's withheld, something that we don't know, something that we want an answer about, and it's sort of intellectual and appears to that uh, appeals to that side of the brain of the of the individual. And I, Michelle, if anybody's got any questions, how are you going to notify me? I will just talk at you. Oh, that's perfect. Okay. So mystery, mystery is that suspense um, is uncertainty and concern about the future and makes us all worried about the outcome emotional. Uh, thriller is something that's happening here and now. That's the adrenaline, adrenaline rush that's going on. And then romance is a secret longing for matching with our own hurts so that uh, our own hurts so that we're reading basically of ourselves. And I, I call that one, you know, the hormones. But I think all of those work together in the brain and the body and pull the reader in. And I read hundreds of books per year in addition to poetry, short stories, and individual essays. And I really think one of the greatest things, and I'd like you to see, uh, I got this sort of start from uh, reading something from Ray Bradbury uh, about his daily reading list. And if you're not doing it, I recommend that you do it. I, I do it uh, uh, very focused and strenuously. Um, each day I read fiction, nonfiction, a play, a film, poetry, one or more of those, and short stories, essays. Then I even, even though I've been doing this a long time, I read about grammar and punctuation in the current news. And now, and I'll tell you, you said grammar and punctuation once you're a writer and you've published a lot. Yes, because it's very important because what we want to do is make sure that somebody stays within the scene that gets so wrapped up in that scene that they don't leave and grammar and punctuation can throw you off, especially these days if you're publishing traditionally, for example, they don't have the editorial staff that they used to have. 
in order to line edit and do a lot of things that uh, used to be uh, a courtesy to to writers and it's just economics and so writers really have to and nothing no, it, even when you read a book grammar and punctuation something will throw you off out of the scene if you read something that's there so i recommend i recommend all of those what I've got to say, I really don't think I've got anything original. I think uh, I'm going to go with uh, Sir Isaac Newton's letter to a friend back in 1676, you know, where he says, if I can see further, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants. So basically, I'm just looking at what I've, I've worked with done before and I've had some great teachers I've done some projects with Stephen King I've done some projects with I worked for a long time as an employee for Steven Spielberg and so I've had a long long list of great storytellers that I've worked for and so I've just gleaned a lot as I've gone along and I've also you know been through the college academic uh, degree programs and so I'm a terminal and so I uh, I think of bringing all of that together uh, I think authors, if you read enough, you see authors basically tell stories as shapeshifters. It's the same stories, you know, but if the author's good, you, you know, you'll never know it. So I like, I like Leo Tolstoy's, uh, I forget what book it's from, but he, he says, uh, you know, happy families are all alike and every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. I think none of us want to read about the happy families. I think everybody wants to read about the unhappy families. And it's that conflict, uh, that mystery thriller suspense uh, that um, that keeps the pages turning. And I, th and I think things without those elements are frankly boring because I think all good writing is some sort of commentary on the human experience. And if you think about yourself, there are things that people don't know but are curious about and may not ask. And there are things that you are personally worried about in the future because you can't control it. And then there are things that are happening to you. And I don't care what you're doing right now in your life right now, those things are going on with you. And I know for a fact that they're probably going on with your characters as well. So again, I, I said, you know, I'm, I do checklists. I value architecture over uh, lean tos. And th this, this is a joke that I, I hope you, you know, you get, uh, you can build the perfect structure by doing one of two things. And I really mean this, you can build the perfect structure. So that's not a judgment, perfect structure by planning ahead, or refining your lean to. And if you want architecture, you'll do the same thing, but you'll do it in a different order, it just depends. So uh, that's really, I just want to say that's my comment on what I sometimes view as the ridiculous discussion of this planner or pantser thing, because the most, I think, I honestly think it's the most annoying discussion I think two writers can have with each other. Let's get on to something that's, that's more serious, because people, as I talked to Howard talking about painting prior to when we started this, painters have different ways that they work, so it really doesn't matter. But if you've got the checklist, which is what I've got, it doesn't really matter which way you write, uh, you're going to be able to use that checklist in order to get what you need to see. Um, we, do have a, we do have a question in the chat. Yes, Go ahead, Kevin. Absolutely. Hi, Kevin. Unmute. Kevin, you're doing the same thing I do. You have the power, but you didn't know it. <laughs> uh, I didn't have any question. I was just wondering how I got. I didn't have a question at this point in time. Okay. I think. Oh, I I'm th sorry. It was Karen. I misread it. Karen, go ahead. Yeah. Checklists of what? I'm about to give them to you. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> sorry. Got it. <laughs> yeah, I'm about to get you. Uh, one of them's coming right now. Um, the four. Uh, building blocks of elemental as opposed to genre, um, elemental mystery, thriller, suspense, and romance is one, the concept. And you're going to see me using this. I have I grew up, you know, I was, before I became a full-time working writer, I was a brick mason among other things. So I tend to think of, think in terms of uh, houses. The concept or the story is the finished house. 
Now, some people have the finished house in mind before they start, and some people build the lean-to, and then they build on to it, and they end up with a great mansion by the time it's over. So it really doesn't matter. The concept or the story is the finished house. The second is the characters, which I view as the rooms of the house, kind of like uh, Robert McKee was talking about earlier, but I have a different little concept on. Again, it's personalized. And then the scenes, sections, or chapters, and that really just depends on what you're writing, are the tour of the rooms within. And those are the words, the sentences, and the paragraphs. And Karen, I'm going to get into those in just a moment uh, as well. And then there's the plot, which is the unseen architecture, the two by fours um, inside. And for me, the plot comes from the character. Other people have characters and then, I mean, a plot and then, then the characters come. But for me, uh, it's always the characters. Those are the ones I always remember. Now, note that I did not mention the book because the book for me falls under the characters, which are the rooms in the house. And that's just the way that I think. It's not the right way necessarily. It's the way that I think. So for me... I do a lot of thinking ahead before I begin writing the first things because I found that you may be different from me, but my first ideas are not always the best. So I always question why bother writing them if they're no good. So the more thinking and planning that I do before writing a book, the more I free myself up just to enjoy the process of telling the story once I begin. And this begins with a, a series of questions for everything you write. And Karen, again, we're going into our list here. So mystery, thriller, suspense, and romance are brought in through what I view as four story subparts, uh, which I hope we have the time to discuss all of these. Uh, if not, um, you've got them here and you can do your own thinking, which is probably the best learning experience you can do or your own investigation through the reading recommendation I had. But it's genre, character, scene, and location. For those, for me, those are the most important things and the story itself comes from that. And whether you do, uh, I hope that you have the flexibility if you're doing some sort of outline before you write that you're open to new things, or if you're uh, just writing and trying to discover that you're open to creating a better architecture in the drafts that follows. So this is what I was telling you about, Howard, before I start writing a scene, and this is a little bit on the Robert McKee thing that um, Sandy had pointed out, before I start writing a scene, because I'm a filmmaker and I'm used to dealing with storyboards, um, I like to draw it. And I use those little bubble things where every little uh, thing comes out and I make notes of the textures, the information, the characters. This is before I ever start writing. Uh, the textures, the information, the characters, the sensory input, the thoughts, inspirations, the mood, the atmosphere. And then when you tell the scene, I'm basically using that drawing with all of those little bubbles in there. So the more vivid that I can get the, the, the drawing, the more vivid is my writing. So for me, the drawing is where I create the effect that I'm after. Now you can do this mentally, but for me, I, I read a lot, I review books, and for me, there is many times not a sense of place. And for me, I think character, I mean, location, the sense of place is as much a character as any of the other characters that are in that scene. And so uh, having that in your head, and I think for me, it's the actual thing of, you know, taking a, a piece of paper and drawing that out and just writing myself notes before I ever start writing, I get a feel for the suspense, a feel for the mystery, a feel for the thriller elements, if, if, if it's appropriate for that, in there. So it, to me, it all comes down to movement. You've got to keep moving forward because if you don't, again, I've got PTSD from live television. I'm so scared, even if you're reading a book, I am so scared that you are going to change the channel. I am so scared that you're going to have to get up and go pee and then not come back. I am so scared of all those things. And I want you to sit there with your legs crossed and not move, or at least take the book with you when you go. So movement 
for me is the essence of a good story. And you get that through the mystery, thriller, suspense, and romance. So I'm going to give you some, I, I always feel so uncomfortable talking to professional writers such as you guys, because I, I'm like, a bunch of this stuff is basic stuff, but I'm going to say it. So I ask that your forgiveness from the, for, from the start for some of these things, but to move things forward, write in an active voice. Uh, I get so many books in the mail that are not, um, that want me to review them or to interview them for my Writer's Digest column. And you start reading it and it's non-active voice and it slows things down. It really does. So get rid of all. And I, under, and I would like to underscore the word all, get rid of all of the B words. Uh, the am, is, are, was, were, being, been, B, B words for me, B, B stands for boring. And uh, so get rid of them. I, every time I write something, I run a search for every one of those words. And when I find them, I rewrite the sentence and turn it into an active sentence. And um, get rid of all unnecessary words because they slow things down. Um, uh, to if, if you're trying to get the movement forward, which is part of the whole thriller concept, moving forward, something's happening, something's happening, something's happening, extra unnecessary words slow down. I'm gonna tell you a line from a book that I just, I'm, I'm looking at, I just read last, last night, where she held the gun in her hand, okay? Well, I, to me, that's duh, unless you've told me something that she's, you know, that's non-typical about her previously, what else is she going to hold it with her foot or her nostrils? Of course, she's holding it with her hands. And so what the reader wants to know is not where is she holding it? Well, one would assume in her hand, they want to know what she's going to do next. And then um, I think it, it was a reference in the in Sandy's thing with Robert McKee here about the uh, length of the paragraph. And these are just techniques that you use that are really just techniques. Whenever I want to speed up the thriller element within it, I change, I change the length of the paragraph. And I intentionally do that because it gives the impression that things are moving faster. And suddenly with that pace, they start turning the pages quicker because, you know, there's more white space on the page. So they're getting through that page quicker. And then when I want to be a little slower and stuff, I go back to the longer things. And it's just, it's just a trick you're playing with the reader. But um, also... Uh, I don't know, you know, you guys are all youngsters, but for me, I started out when we just had an old typewriter and it wasn't even electric typewriter. It was, a, and then when I made uh, copies, when I first started selling stories, I had carbon paper, which, you know, I say that to my college students and they have no clue what I'm talking about, carbon paper. So I got carbon paper in there, but I always knew to be aware of the bottom of the page and the ends of sections. And so you make, you, wh whether you're writing your prose, your film, your stage play, whatever, you're combating personal distractions. And um, so at the bottom of the page, I always, always, even if I had to indent an, an additional paragraph at the top, and if you're sending this in to um, an editor or you're uh, trying to get an agent, this sounds silly. But keep it in mind, because at the bottom of the page, you always need to have an oh my. And so um, whenever I'm writing, if my oh my appears up here on this other page, I will actually fudge a little to get my oh my back down at the bottom, because that forces the reader to turn the page. We're creating a sense of suspense in that. Now, I'm going to say a bad word that I, I say, but we're, we're all adults here. So at the end of each section, for me, I always have an oh shit. So I have an oh my at the bottom of the, every page, and then I have an oh shit at the end of the thing. And that keeps the readers moving forward. Again, that's creating that sense of suspense. 
Uh, don't let your formatting cause the reader to leave the page. And you do that through, here's a little list for, for you. Howard uh, has, has a comment or question before you jump into the list. Oh, Howard, don't reprimand me for my no. work. <laughs> no, I, 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 liked your, I liked your comment about movement. I thought you're, you're right on the ball with that. And I, I always have a, a discussion uh, from time to time with my colleagues and the uh, the writing groups I'm in, and it's the balance between dialogue and description. And my feeling is that sometimes description goes on too long, and and it and it slows it down. And that's why I tend to be, yeah, I give I give enough description, but I don't want to give too much description. And and so I think uh, I really took to heart your comment on movement because you have to be careful, I think, as a writer, not to overdo the description, because people start to lose interest if you go too far in getting down to the minutia of a description. So I just wanted to compliment you on bringing well, that. Well, thank you, Howard. Um, and, and following up on the, the description, um, I usually try to pick things, really everything that you include in there should be of value to the story that's moving forward. Because again, we are moving it, we are building an architecture of a house and everything in there has to have some sort of practical or aesthetic value. And so to, as you say, too much description slows things down. And sometimes without having to give the description, which is something that I like to do, which I think moves the story forward, is that a character is sitting there, maybe my point of view character, and is in somebody else's house, and they are in New, Jer New, New Jersey, and they happen to look up and see the three Georgia O'Keeffe paintings on the wall. And I have it in the action itself rather than describing, and sometimes, Howard, that helps move things forward as well. So, um, one more Getting question. Back. Cheryl wants to say something. Absolutely, Cheryl. Uh, hi, Clay. I just need to clarify something. You said the oh my was at the bottom of the page and the oh shit was at the end of the thing. What thing? <laughs> I need to come up with something other than Well, the no, oh that's shit. okay. But, but where did you put that, that one, the oh shit? At the end of each section. Now, some people write oh, very short. Section. Okay. Yeah, some people write very short chapters. Some people write s sections within chapters, but in all, you know, where they're changing maybe point of view or something, but in all of those, um, I, th I think it's important at the end of that, because you always lead them moving forward with this, using suspense in the situation. Um, Cheryl, I've got something to tell you. But first, I'm going to talk to Judy. And so um, that makes you think you have to come, keep that, you know, once again, I'm trying to keep you from going pee, right? So that's my, uh, that's why I say at the end of that, it's the, uh, oh, shit, what's he going to tell me? And, and so I'll pick it back up in the next section or whatever, but it depends on the length of what the writer is doing. Um, and I and for me, I think consistency is good. I usually like to keep my sections the same length, my chapters the same length. So I'm I tend to be because I think there's something about a symmetry in the mind of the reader. Uh, commercial breaks back in old television, they came in a, a certain time. Everybody knew to expect them at a certain point. And I think you develop that rhythm in the the book itself. And I help I think that helps the reader to kind of just stay centered and not be distracted by anything. But they need to stay lost in what you're writing. And you do that through your word choice, your sentence structure, uh, your clarity, your pacing. And for me, again, you know, I am, I, I overdo. I know that I overdo, but you know, I've, I've had some su success with it. So it seems to be working for me, but I overdo. I tear each sentence and each word apart to see just what I'm trying to paint. And, and a lot of my, my you know, illusions go back to painting and art as well. So I, I, I hear people say, I write 2000 words per day. And I, you know, I, I think, well, that good for you. Are, are any of them any good? So, um, so I, I think the quota is really, I want to write some really good stuff. But I, um, 
I want to, uh, but I, I, I and I, I want to, for me, I have a certain amount of time that I sit in my chair every day. And I do write every day because I think it's like tennis. You, the, you have to write every day in order to be able to keep, keep the juice going, to keep the flow going. Um, but anyway, so now we're going. All right. Well, sorry. We got to stop again because Karen has another question. Quit interrupting me. No, I'm kidding. I really <laughs> love the interruptions. Sorry. I, I care. Oh, oh. Hi. <laughs> How do you figure out where your oh my and your oh shit are going to fall when you're just creating the book in the first place? It hasn't been to an editor or anything. How do you know where it's going to fall on the well, page? Well, for me, the way I write, my my mentality is I start right if I'm doing and I write multiple ways. I write I just sit down because I don't know where I'm going and I just start pecking away. And then, or I do, you know, some sort of, I call it, you call it an outline, but it's not really an outline. It's an overview. It's that artwork of that, that room and what can happen in the room. And, and, and some of the things that the, the bullet points that I'm going to get to will explain a little more about that. But I, I always go, I'm writing along and my thinking is constantly what can go wrong. And that's, right up front so no when I, I type my first sentence uh karen is sitting listening to the uh, presentation and i think what can go wrong and why does it matter to her and what are so what are the stakes so then i start i put that in and then when i get a really good one where it's like karen you know is just realized she's you know lost her house uh i'm i go oh there's a great oh shit. So now I, I go on to something else and I divide that up. Now, another psychological thing for readers is to have those small sections. And so whenever, even if you're having one continual, say first person, and you're going all the way through, you still break those up because it gives a psychological, I'm moving. Patterson does this great. Patterson does this really, really well. You give these sections because that keeps the pages turning. Okay. And it's, a, it's all just psychological. You're messing with the reader's psychology, and it's even beyond the story itself. But when you, when you get to that point where you think, wow, that was really good, dun, dun, dun. <laughs> okay, now it's time to have a new Stop. section. And they go, man, it's 1130. I really got to get up at 530 in the morning, but it's just one more short section. And so then they're going to finish that. But what happens at the end of that section? Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> and you keep them up then the rest of the night. So that's how I do it. So gotcha. I always, and, and then if I'm doing, if I'm looking at it from an outline point of view, because I, I said, I go back and forth between the two. If I, if I'm in a section where I need to structure then I will find a spot and say, ah, that's my cliffhanger right there. That's it. So I approach it in two different ways, but I always make sure that it's there. Okay. Thank you. Uh-huh. Absolutely. So uh, we talked about uh, we talked about genres. And I, I think as writers, we need to forget what we know as genre. Um, uh, genres came around because that's where a book is supposed to be placed in a bookstore or where it's going to be coded online. It's not valuable at all to a writer in, in, in my point of view. Um, what I think a story has to have a primary genre, but let's redefine what the genres are. It may have secondary genres, let me say that. Uh, you know, the hyphens and uh, but let's focus what on the primary genre is going to be when we start out. And I think that within each genre, it, 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 within each true genre, not where it's on the, the shelf, but what you're writing, um, it has opportunities for mystery, thriller, suspense, romance built in into those various uh, things. And I think opportunities fail when you uh, don't know what genre you're writing or you deviate from the genre you're writing and for remember we're not talking about the genres you know of in the bookstore we're going to talk we're going to talk about these other ones because the genres will tell us what to expect from the content it'll um 
it's us. He's like, can someone remind me of what we want at the end of the page? You can call it whatever you want. I call it, oh my. <laughs> so um, this, listen, I'm not Moses. So you don't, have, you, you come up with your own things that work. <laughs> You don't have to, you don't have to take it word for word for me. Um, so I, genres is going to tell us what to expect from the content, the purpose, uh, how the work is to be interpreted and the elements to explore. Those are the mystery, thriller, suspense, romance. And uh, here's some things that are called genres that are absolutely of no use to any of us. And I'm going to go through these because I know that I'm always I'm always going to run out of time. I talk too much, so uh, I'm always going to run out of time. So I'm going to run through these quickly. But really, what I want you to do is go, you know, slam on the brakes if there's any one of these because I want Karen to get her list right. So I want everybody to get your bullet points. So if I run through things too quickly, stop me, and we will talk about something that's of special interest to you. But these are. These are things that are called genres in or media, but they have absolutely no use to us as writers. One is children's, young adults, adults, historicals, nonfiction, comedy, drama, literary, tragedy, plays, poetry, and films, okay? Those I don't like to include in genres because they don't tell us much about anything. Does anybody have any question on any of that? No? Okay. So yeah. let's move on to genre. Actually, we do. Um, okay. Cheryl? Cheryl has yeah. a comment or question. I have a question, Clay. Um, so, um, I've been told ad nauseum uh, in screenwriting. <laughs> the statement, yes. Yeah, the statement, know your genre, because you have points that have to be in that genre. And if you miss them, you won't even be considered. Is that to be ignored or is that? No, that's not to be ignored. Let's just make okay. sure that we, I'm going to talk about genres that matter. Okay, okay. I, I just told you the genres that do not matter. Okay. Thank like, you. for example, and let me give you a clarification on one, Cheryl, that, uh, for example, let's say we're writing a young adult novel. That young adult novel may be an action adventure, which is a true genre, but it's just the age of the character itself. Those, those things that I mentioned to you previously are ones that people get caught up in. I'm going to write a young adult novel. I'm going to write a children's novel. I'm going to write a, a nonfiction book. Nonfiction books, except for scientific texts, that's a different thing. But nonfiction books, such as memoirs or something that's, you know, it's a, some sort of travel thing, it, it, they're, they're, all of these fall into true genres that are applicable to writers but sometimes we get caught up in looking at you know we may buy a book that says how to write young adult novels no you don't really want a young adult novel if you, 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 you all you do is change the age of the character but if the, if it's an action adventure that you're going to be talking about then we maybe you buy buy a book that says how to write action adventures so i'm just going to tell you the ones that matter and the ones that don't if that helps. Now, as I go through these, if anyone wants to know what what let's dis let's discuss that particular applicable genre in more detail, because each one of these genres that I mention have the space for uh, suspense, thriller, mystery, and romance. Okay, and those are the things that are going to keep the people turning the pages. All right, so. The real genres that we need to pay attention to. And again, if somebody wants to let's talk about this, if, you, if you're writing this particular genre, then stop me and let's talk about this particular one. But action adventure is, is, a, is a, a real one. Uh, fairy tales. And I'll go slow for Karen, you're writing this down? Okay, good. Uh, fantasy horror, mystery, 
satire or political satire, psychological, romance or romantic comedy, science fiction, spy, suspense, and thrillers. Now, does anybody have any question on any of any of those? We can go back and talk, but those those all have elements. Daniel's got a got a got a comment or a question. Um, but those all have elements that are applicable to my writing students. Yeah, if you could at some point touch on um, the difference between a thriller and action adventure. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, let me pull up some notes here too that help me out. Make sure I. Okay, for the uh, action adventure, some notes that I've got here is uh, uh, basically likable main character is usually a fish out of water you've got an unlikable nemesis uh the action adventure usually involves a mission or a quest whereas in the thriller uh it not, not necessarily you don't have that element um, multiple and quick changing settings uh danger is a common element between the two fast pace is a thing between the two um you're going to get um uh, physical action sequences, because the action adventure is going to be a lot more physical action sequences necessarily, not but not not completely uh, between um, the, um, the the action adventure and the thriller. Um, you've got you know attacks, chases, explosions, and can have multiple subplots. But some some usually it's it's going uh, somewhere. The action adventure is truly that, based, Daniel, we're going on an adventure of some sort. So I'm thinking in terms of like the Iliad or the Call of the Wild, uh, Hunger Games, uh, Casino Royale, Mad Max, uh, Fury Road, as opposed to uh, thrillers that can take place in, um, you know, that, that, that basically don't involve the road trip itself does that help uh i think they're they're very close together but the uh the action adventure uh involves that uh is involves that uh that road trip so thriller might be more agatha christie well no she's 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 more for, for me anyway because i'm thinking like medical thrillers legal thrillers espionage spy something like that which is a little bit more racy than what agatha christie was was doing so I, the, the born I the born series or jack Reacher? yes that's there you go there you go there's thrillers there's thrillers okay okay because they're not on a quest necessarily overall i think reacher is on a quest between his books but I think uh, yeah, I, was say, he, I don't know where Reacher's on a quest, but I'm not sure where he's going, and not sure he does either. But uh, right, he, he's more like searching he's, for. He's himself. traveling. He's traveling. Yeah. Okay. But Tad does that has, answer your question, Daniel? Okay, perfect. Tad has a question or a comment. Uh, yeah, question. When you mentioned about um, nonfictions, and you mentioned science is perhaps a valid category. Where would you place self-improvement books? You know, again, I think that those are going to, uh, it, it depends upon what the angle. Um, I think that you can have self-improvement. Again, I'm gonna go back to where I said that everything that is written that turns me on is something that is related to the human experience so uh self-help book um i think that to some degree might fall into that more scientific because you're just talking principles you're not telling a story but for example um i think there was a 
book I read called uh, The Boy Called It, which was uh, talking about child abuse, uh, which was not really self-help per se, but it was in terms of, you know, its enlightening effect. Uh, I'd put that under, under suspense, psychological suspense, and I would tell it as a story, which is how it was told. And that was a nonfiction book. But, yeah, because my book is, it is more of a self-improvement type of a book. It doesn't. Yeah, yeah and that's where, that's that, that was the disclaimer I made for uh, scientific books or okay. something that you're just, if, if you're imparting ideas or principles, then it's hard to turn that into a narrative. And somebody who picks that up is looking for those nuggets that you're going to be offering in, in each of those sections. But so that one, uh, that, that, uh, that would fall under that non-narrative scientific thing that I was talking about before. Okay, great. Thank you. Anytime that you can use any of these to, if something falls into, um, you know, if you're doing a self-help book about uh, relationships, certainly I would look at a narrative model for the romance, romantic comedy and try to incorporate that because it brings a sense of humanness in rather than just data and any kind of that personal human experience that you can bring in, I think will certainly help the self-help book as well. I find myself attracted to uh, achievement self-help books that where the author is basically telling some of their story, some of their journey in, in what they're, uh, what they're doing. And um, I, you know, if you can, if you can include that into the situation, I mean, into, into what you're writing, I think it, it, it actually brings a lot to. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's great, because I, I did include a lot of anecdotes in it, both personal and, you know, anecdotes about the different topics. And that was what one is of it? The, yeah. the old, old people's interest. And what is the what is the theme basically of the whole book, or what's the title of your book? The title of the book is "How to Master the Universe: Personal and Professional Life Skills Guide." Okay. And it's basically sixty-one different topics, all built around a common principle and a three-step formula. Okay. Now th that's going to get into really what I'm going to talk about in a few moments, which is what's the story really about? And basically, mm -hmm. you're telling a quest story. Do you see, can you yes. see that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, so and, and let, fact, let I, us get let us get to the quest then, and we'll talk about that, and 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 maybe you'll find what you're looking for in in the answer on that. Sounds good. Thanks so much. Okay. Absolutely. Other questions before we move on? Okay. And then also, as I said before, um, the. The location to me plays as much importance as a character as actual characters themselves. And the location you're going to find in regional subgenres. And I want to mention these, and I'm happy to discuss these, each one in detail or just one in detail or whatever, if you have a question about that. But um, Um, depending upon where you are. Um, the first one for me, obviously, is because of where I live. The Gothic or Southern Gothic is going to have tons of opportunity for mystery, thriller, suspense, and romance in it. Uh, rural, small town fiction, you can keep the pages turning and I can tell you ways of doing that. Urban and then Western or frontier. And so those are the four things that I, in terms of location that I'd like you to keep in mind as you're writing, because using the, um, using the techniques of those are going to actually help uh, tremendously to bring the story to life. And I think, uh, oh, thanks, Michelle. <laughs> she, He's putting them up there. Great. She types fast, doesn't she? So, um, so I, uh, I definitely think you need to look at those regional subgenres when you are writing. And uh, even even the nonfiction stuff that you're doing, Tad, I would I would look at um, at those regional 
things uh, because there's uh, there's a difference between business and in a small town and business in uh, Wall Street and 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 there's differences in how you handle things and depending upon whether you're in the South or you're in the North or you're you're in the West there's a whole culture difference in all of that and I think when you're writing your book you need to uh, reckon with those. Now let's move into what's the story really about. And this is another list that I'd like you to make. And these are things that uh, where I think, who was it? Uh, Cheryl, was it you talking about the films that everybody needs to, okay, this is, this is where I think we really need to focus uh, on what you were wanting to talk about. And those are mysteries is one of them. The Misfit, Survival, Life Transition, The Quest, Growth, because of another person or another thing. It could be a dog, like where's uh, uh, something about Win Dixie or something like that. A Deal with the Devil. And then there's some non-plot stories. And then under those, uh, I would put atmosphere, tone, mood fiction, character sketch, slice of life, allegory, and montage. And um, those you're going to find more in quote unquote literary journals than you're going to actually find in more mainstream things. Uh, does anyone have any question about any of those before we go on? There was a question Richard had. Um, I'm not sure if it quite relates to that, but it's about the subgenres. Go ahead, Richard. Yeah, Richard. Hi, um, French writer here. So, in case you, you don't place my accent, <laughs> are you in France? No, no, I'm in uh, Canada, but I'm a French Canadian. So, okay, okay. Uh, English is not my uh, mother tongue, so um, okay. I'll try to manage. Um, I'm wondering, and, and the main reason I, I'm not saying that all the other things you're saying are not interesting, but what really attracted me to your talk was um, is because right now I'm working on a novel that combines what would be considered three genres. And some people, um, you know, they, they might say that it's not a good idea or uh, they will talk about, you know, the A story, B story and, um, and usually the romance is the B story in a suspense novel. My, 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 the environment in science fiction, the, the, the plot is kind of a mystery slash action a bit, but uh, what supersedes both of those stories, uh, the, those genre means, uh, I mean, is, the, uh, is, is a romance story. And usually they have a, the action within the science fiction genre, that's okay. And the romance becomes the B story, you know, like the hero has a, a love interest. And, uh, but, and, and I agree with you when you say that genres are a marketing tool. So, uh, and I'm not planning to, <laughs> to uh, win a Pulitzer Prize or whatever with my book. I'm not meaning to uh, be, um, you know, very uh, commercially successful. I just want to write, write a story that I would love to read. And, and that's um, a story you should write. Uh, but but, but what, what do you have to say about the mixing of genres and uh, the A and B and C stories? I think you're, when we get to our discussion about characters, I think you'll see, because really, remember when I said, for me, character is the first thing that goes through. And I think your character, the sci-fi is the world, right? Your primary from, if I get from what you're talking about, I said <clears throat> that you basically need to choose a primary, excuse me, <clears throat> we have everything blooming here in the South and it's all in my nose. So um, the primary is uh, to me, sounds like the romance story, is it not? Yes. Okay. Yes. And then I said that it's perfectly okay to put them together, but just remember the elements that are there. So your, 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 you know, if you were going to do the ABC, which I'm not sure I like, because to me, 
a, maybe it's a, a category, but it sounds like, you know, we're rating it in terms of importance. Yeah. And I don't necessarily like that idea of an ABC or uh, the first, second, and third, you know, in, in terms of priority. I can see we, we're talking about some sort of linear progression, but uh, I, I'd really look at the character uh, themselves and let the ABC story come out of that. The science fiction, you're going to have to uh, have to have the, uh, the world that you're creating, but that's the location that I was talking about. And there's things that you're going to have to have in that in order to be able to, and, and, and we can, we can talk about that if we need to more, but uh, I think you're on the right path. Is it you, you have to pick one genre? I don't think so. I really think you need to get out of that. Where is it going to be in a bookstore and just write a good story, like you said, that you want to write? Because to me, that's the most important thing because you don't know how much money you're going to make off something. The 4 million books I sold uh, were all by accident. I didn't know that Walmart was going to pick them up and Target and, and uh, Sam's Club and Costco and start sending them out, you know, pallets of 20,000 all over. I had no clue that that was going to happen. And so uh, I, I think that you just choose things that are important to you and mixing up the different types of old traditional, where you find it in the bookstore genres, uh, is a way to make it fresh. So Richard, I think you're on the right track in what you're doing. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't overanalyze and I wouldn't overthink. I would just write the story that I wanted to write. And I guarantee you, if you write one that you want to read and you do it uh, the way you want, you'll, end, you'll find an agent who, who supports that. So uh, follow your own muse. Don't get caught up in this other stuff of the ABCs and stuff. Uh, that you're doing just take a character and run with that character okay well it, it's great to be uh, justified in my choices but i, I do realize but again that, remember i'm not moses so i can't i know i know, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> i'm just bouncing ideas with with someone with experience and, just giving and, you my opinion <laughs> <laughs> but i know that a library uh, or a bookstore rather would probably classify uh, my book as a science fiction story and I know that most science fiction uh, uh, readers uh, would probably be turned off uh, realizing they're reading uh, a romance in a science fiction environment. Now, I've, uh, I've read I've read sci-fi that's got that's got romance in it, so I I, I don't think they're going to be turned off at all. I think you just should just continue following your muse. I'd like right. to weigh in on that as well. Um, because I write sci-fi and fantasy, and um, I believe that sci-fi readers and fantasy readers in particular expect there to be other elements of what you consider other genres woven in. Otherwise, it's incredibly boring. They expect there to be political satire. They're, they expect there to be romance. They expect there to be action adventure. So, you know, I think that it the, the cross genre is is something that is very alive and well within the science fiction fantasy realm. Well said. Richard, keep writing. I will. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else got any other questions before we move on? Or comments? Or disagreements? You can have disagreements. Okay. So what's the story really about? Um, I, I had those eight uh, story types that... Uh, that I mentioned, which was, you know, the mystery, the misfit, the survival and stuff. Anybody any, got anything on any of those that you want to discuss? I think those, Richard, are more important than the other things that you were talking about. Uh, you're um, looking, at, looking at your book, um, I think it will definitely fall into more just forget sci-fi that's a location okay forget forget the romance for example and just concentrate on whether it's a mystery is it a misfit is it a character that's um you know that doesn't fit in anywhere else is it a survival story and you've got your love uh thing going on in it is it a life transition is it a quest for something uh, is this person going to change like a buddy movie or something, you know, growth because of another person or thing? Um, and or are they doing something uh, that is, uh, 
um, where they're bas basically Faust selling their soul? Is it the deal with the devil in order to be able to achieve something within this sci-fi world that you're doing? And I think that's really where you need to focus your attention, not so much on uh, the sci-fi, again, uh, very important, but in terms of your writing, your characters, uh, they live where they live. They don't know anything different. It, they, they don't live in another world. They live in their world. So you just make it real to those particular characters and then follow those eight that we were talking about. Does that help? Anybody else got anything that they want to add to that? Somebody said they wanted to uh, have me repeat again. One is mystery. These are the ones that, that what, 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 what's the story really about? It's a mystery. It's a misfit who's uh, trying to fit in and usually perceived as a threat to a group. Um, uh, there's survival um, and that can be against, you know, uh, characters must survive, you know, against uh, uh, natural or supernatural forces. Uh, there's life transition, you know, birth of a child, marriage, divorce, death of someone, uh, the quest, growth because of another, uh, the deal with the devil. And then I mentioned the, the number, the eight is the non-plot stories, which are not uh, going to be more as commercially successful. Uh, the atmosphere, tone, mood, fiction, character, sketch, slice of life, allegory and the montage. Now, I like uh, old, any old film by Sergei Eisenstein. I, uh, I tend to like those if you haven't seen them, uh, but uh, he was the founder of montage and uh, I really enjoy them because you get it. But you're, those, the, that last one I was talking about, we're, we're talking more in, the, in poetry. Uh, and I haven't heard anybody say that they are writing poetry right here, but you know, if you're, if you're writing poetry, these non-plot stories of atmosphere, tone, mood, fiction, character, sketch, slice of life, allegory, montage are ones that are great in order to, uh, to do poetry. So if nobody's got any more questions, we'll go on to characters. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I have one question more. Um, You've already had your turn, Richard. No, go okay. ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> You're talking <laughs> about growth, ahead, but growth. Uh, unless we're talking about two-dimensional characters, like, uh, for example, Sherlock Holmes, who's always the same. Um, if we're talking about a three-dimensional character, there's necessarily a growth in that character. So aren't all three-dimensional character-driven stories about growing? Yes. In my opinion, now Robert McKee might say something else. I don't know, but uh, yes, in my opinion, yes, I think it's all about growth. And each character, segueing into what we're talking about, whether they're large or small, is like the rest of us. Uh, it they're the main character in their own story, right? All the other characters are supporting characters, so each character, therefore, Richard has their own character arc. And so as a former actor, there's no small parts. So all individual character point of views <clears throat> and locations, remember I said, because I want to use location as a character, um, in the planning stages of a scene, there are multiple characters, there are multiple eyes in every scene until it is the one eye uh, that I want to use from the point of view of that scene and the rest are then incorporated as observations from whatever POV the, the scene is told, whether it's third, first, or whatever it is. Every character, Richard, has a goal and uh, the idea is to prevent them from reaching it. And um, so I'm gonna talk about a little bit, uh, the protagonist, um, a few things about the protagonist. Um, They uh, are a follower of, um, I think they're a follower of dark alleys in search of adventure or discovery, both in life and self. They're solitary uh, transit as they're going through. 
Uh, it's self to cover, uh, self discovery, and I think Richard, you're right. It's self development. The antagonist is going to be uh, greedy, wanting all for self, inflated egos, self terrorized, uh, alert for aggressions, fear haunted, self achieved independence, um, and um, I think that there's contradictions and the character movements, I guess, that we were talking about in the arc. That reminds me of character movements, Richard. Um, the arc, um, I think, it, let, me, let me talk a little bit how I put characters together. I look at movements. And so they can enter, I'm going to give you the, the movements that I'm looking at. And you can have a character enter at any of these, but let's say it's going to be your main character. Um, so you're going to have a, the first movement, which is movement one. For me, I would already have the character in conflict because each of you sitting wherever you're sitting right now, isn't there something conflict going on in your life right now? So a lot of times we start characters in this perfect world, you know, uh, some, some, uh, theorists call it, you know, the known world, but in the known world, there's, they're already in conflict. So then you have a catalyst, then you have an ominous excitement, once again, ominous, suspenseful, or you've got this presage nervousness that everything is going to go wrong. And then following that, that's your introduction to your character, right? They've already got a problem then something else happens, which is more leading you into the story. And then they're either going to be excited about it or they're going to dread what's about to happen. But you know, the way you write it, the words you use, the way you describe your location, you set it up knowing that there are going to be problems. Then following that, you're going to have sequential movements. Now, I'm not into, I'm not into the act structure per se that a lot of people teach i just think that there are sequential movements of these characters because remember what i'm i from my perspective i'm following characters through so they enter this next movement uh you, you could go to like a sid field uh thing and call them plot points but he only has two major plot points for me there's plot po excuse me there's plot points all through every time the the oh shit and oh my's are plot points something is about to switch in a different way so i don't want to confine it to again i don't want to be pedantic and say that you've got to have this you've got to have that because every story and every character is going to but you're going to end the, go into the sequential movements and you're going to enter the movement then you're going to go in this winding graph trajectory that's going to go up or down and you're going to end and this goes into hey this goes into the robert mckee thing that we were talking about with uh, sandy um at the end of that movement you're going to have a end higher or you're going to get lower than when you entered that particular section of the movement so the next to the last movement you're going to have, you're going to enter the movement just like normal, wherever they happen to be, high, low, and then you're going to have a trajectory down. And I think every character needs this, that if you, even, even if it's just in a scene and you've got the waiter, the waiter has some sort of conflict coming in. It's a single scene. The character just appears. The waiter appears for me. And again, I overanalyze everything, but for me, I've got the, the waiter, I have to think about the waiter. What's going on in the waiter? It's mine. Let me look at my artwork that I've created before I've started this scene. What's going on with the waiter? There's something wrong when they start, they come into the situation and something is introduced that sends them in a different direction. And then they go up and down inside the scene and some of it may be taking place you know off screen where nobody is seeing it but when they come back they're changed when they're bringing the soup and you know they may be changed every time they bring a different dish right so uh something is going on and in that last movement there is uh well the next to the last one that i was talking about you enter that movement and the trajectory goes down and then they hit the bottom. And in the last movement, they wanna come back and they that's where you have a defeat or win. Now that's in your big protagonist or your villain, right? And I think villains even have bad days as well. I think they go down and then they, they come back up when they're, they're defeated. 
So um, I think the trajectory, you're talking about the character growth, Richard, I think the, the, the character arcs, the trajectory of that follows those particular prescriptions for the characters, okay? So anybody got any comments, questions on that before we move on? No, what we have about we have about the 10 minute mark you asked for. Okay, thanks. I appreciate that very much. Um, let me jump jump to what I think is a prescription for a great story. And there's going to be a lot of moving parts in this, but I I write this out uh, on the board when I, I teach at the university and in in sessions and uh, uh, then we go through and break it down. And so um, here's my prescription for a great story. A Michelle, you ready to type real quick? <laughs> a self-sacrificing <laughs> and endangered main character finds himself in an impossible and impending situation in a fenced yard where stakes are high. And that could be physical, psychological, or emotional life and death. And I, you know, physical life and death, psychological life and death, emotional life and death. And innocent people will suffer because of a moral issue if he doesn't act with courage that he isn't sure that he has and with skills that he doesn't know he has. But of course, we foreshadowed them as time and options run out. Now, I could teach a whole course on what I just told you right there. But for a short story, whether it's uh, Jack London's to build a fire or whatever, you're going to have a self-sacrificing and endangered main character finds himself in an impossible and impending situation in a fenced yard. That means he can't get out, right? Where stakes are high and innocent people are going to suffer because of a moral issue. And when I say innocent people, maybe the dog is going to suffer and to, and to build a fire, uh, suffer because of a moral issue. If he doesn't act with courage that he's not sure that he's got, and with skills that he doesn't know that he has, but we're going to foreshadow them as time and options run out. So does anybody have any questions on that? Because I've just given you a prescription for a book or a short story that is uh, that makes people pay attention. No I think thought? you're going to have to come back another time. <laughs> well, that particular one, we can take the phrase down uh, to for each each one of those uh, each one of those sections. As I said, I tend to circle them on the board as I go through as we talk about each one of those. But uh, just I did see a, a, a hand go up, but I can't. I, but then it went back down. Oh no, Cheryl, go ahead, Cheryl. Um, Clay, does that is that little prescription for success on your website somewhere? No trying to write it down but i got lost oh. yeah i get i get lost too that's why it changes every time i say it oh. <laughs> okay. all right but um do we do we want to break that down or do we want to move on to the scene move on it is okay. it is daniel, up to you daniel says move on uh, invite me back and we'll we'll spend a whole section talking about the rx for a great story how does that sound you're on okay so let's move on to the scene because i don't really think we need to talk about to, for me the house is built of the rooms we don't start with the house. We start with building the foundation, building the rooms, decorating the rooms. And in the end of it all, we've got something that's got street value, right? And so for me, it's not, it's a sense of discovery. Even though I may outline something, for me, it's if I outline something, I'm basically writing it just in shorthand is basically what I'm doing. Um, and then coming back and crossing something out and getting a new idea and writing something that could happen in that scene. And so I'm just kind of replanning um, how, how I do that. But the scene itself, the discovery of a novel is not taking place in the novel. The discovery of the novel takes place within the scene. And so scenes tell part of the whole story, but you don't, and here's where 
uh, Howard, we were talking about things that slow things down. Um, scenes, especially at the beginning of a story, the major mistake I see, even in published books, is that people are trying to, authors are trying to cram so much into that one opening scene to make sure you explain everything. That's mystery. Don't tell everything up front. Leave questions all the way through. And every time you go to a different room, something else is answered. So don't cram everything into one scene. And, but of course, you know, by the end of it, don't leave out any of the parts that need to be in the, expose all of the rooms. Don't leave anything out. So utilizing the elements in the scene, what have we got in the scene to work with? Okay, I'm gonna give, uh, was it Karen, you wanted the list? Uh, here's, here's a list. You want to write fast on this. Uh, and I could, you know, I could come back and we could, could talk for a long time on this as well, but utilizing the elements of the scene, we could, we could spend time talking about each one of these, but characters, and this is my checklist. Remember at the very beginning, I said, I use a checklist and I, I write this, I, I, when I'm planning out a scene, when I'm drawing out the scene, when I write the scene, when I go back to revisit the scene, my, I am the, a believer that you've got to be in the zone and the brain, well, I mean, scientifically, with, we, uh, Tad was talking about his book, success book, maybe he's got it in it, but the mind can really, we can, jump from task to task, but we can only think of one task at a time. So for me, writing out what I'm looking at right now is, is the thing that, that, then this is my checklist. And I'm going to go through them really quick. So write really quick because I'm running out of time. What, I'm down to five minutes now, Michelle? Pretty close. Yeah, okay. probably okay. that or a little less. Okay, I'll, I'll talk fast, but you guys write fast as well. Go at each scene that you write, go and look for the what can I put in in terms of the questions of something that is unknown, which is the mystery. What can I put in in questions that somebody is feeling pressure right now, which is, um, and we don't know how it's going to turn out. Uh, the pressure right now is the thriller turnout, suspense, and then everybody has these personal longings inside and romance, no matter what genre you're writing is going to factor into, into that. Okay. So here's, here's, here's what I do with my checklist. And I go through characters. I look for those arcs. Well, I don't have time to explain all of what I'm looking for in each one of these. Let me just run through the list. And if I have, if, if I have time, I'll go back characters, um, conflicts. I've got to have conflicts between all of the characters. The setting as the character. How does the setting become a character? Uh, the interior thoughts, the action that takes place inside, the character history. Remember, and I don't want to give it all. I just want to drop little tidbits here and there. And that's where I find that my quote unquote outlining helps because if I know the back history of a character, I can divide it up all the way through the entire story so that uh, by the end of the story, they know the character, but it's not all introduced as Howard was talking about pointing it out right up front. Um, the character history, um, dialogue, how's my dialogue going and what information uh, do you convey in that? And I mean, you can do a whole section on dialogue, resolution, point of view, the description of the setting. Why does your character choose to live where he lives or why is he where he is? And why does the other person choose to live in this? And what does the home and environment say about them? Uh, the character description. And I love it when it comes from another character, not from the, the character, the author saying the character description, but from another. A description of the action, the emotion that's in it because we are moved by emotion. Every scene needs to have emotion. Uh, senses. A lot of time we just do sight and sound on things, but there's touch and taste and hearing. Uh, there's people picking up paper and paper. I don't know, you know, if you feel paper, paper feels different, no matter what kind of paper it is. There's differences in stationery and, and legal pads. And then these uh, 
uh, composition books and the paper feels different. Bring that out if it's if it's bearing in on the story, taste, hearing, um, plot, uh, and looking at it as uh, as Sandy said with the Robert McKee thing. What is the function or purpose in the whole novel of this particular? scene that I've written, and hopefully you had that in mind before you wrote it down, what can the reader intuit rightly or wrongly, and what is the goal or purpose of the scene, what characters are in the scene, and which ones are missing, and what are they doing while they are off the, the, the stage, what's at stake, Everything's, every character, uh, Richard, has got to have something at stake, at every minute and that's what makes that's what makes us propel forward will somebody get it will somebody take it away from somebody else um what's the main conflict what choices inside each scene choices are being made what choices are there and there's got to be a beginning a middle and an end and there's got to be i agree with mckee's thing or uh, i don't know that he cares if i agree or not but I, I agree with his thing that you know there's got to be a change between the beginning middle and end but it's got that dynamic that's going in there and with each scene start in the action uh in each book you write please start in the action don't give a lot of description up up front to get a slow start let's start remember they always have problems before they ever begin and what does each character want? Because each character is the one in their own world, right? And how are the character's wants in conflict with others? And if they are not in conflict with others, by Jove, make them in conflict with others. Uh, you don't have the dynamics going. You need to have them all in conflict because we love conflict. We love watching train wrecks, and I don't know why, but we do. And we want that in our, in our fiction and even in our nonfiction. And character arcs, as we talked about with Richard, and uh, not only that, but look at the character relation arcs, because we all have in our relationships, those things arc. So it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of planning, because you got to list all the characters in the book, and do they know each other? And if they do know each other, then they've got a relationship arc that's going to be taking place. And then always, always, always the look for at the end of it, oh my, or oh shit, cliffhanger at the end. And so hopefully I've covered all of that, and we've made it in the airtime before we go to commercial, Michelle. You did. You did a great job. And Trisha <laughs> warned me about you. So I knew. I knew. <laughs> That's funny. Um, so just so everyone knows, and, and I'm going to turn this back over to Howard here in a second. Um, I will leave the Zoom up uh, after while we're tearing down for as long as I can. So you'll be able to visit and chat and, and such. But moving over to Howard. Well, thank you very much, Clay. Everybody enjoyed your discussion and it was very penetrating and appealing to what we do as writers. So uh, I think you've scored a major hit here. And um, uh, uh, I'm going to turn it back to Michelle to tell us about the guest speaker next month. Michelle. Okay, I am back again. So next month we have Lisa Diane Kastner returning. She spoke, she actually gave a workshop last year on, um, I can't remember exactly what the topic was. Oh, fitting, fitting your writing into your lifestyle and moving forward into your goals for publication. This time she's going to be sp speaking on story structure. And Lisa Diane Kastner is the founder and executive editor of Running Wild Press and Rise Presses. Featured in Forbes and several other publications, she's been named a multiple best of. Um, she's also a writer and an editor for more than 20 years. She has an MFA and MBA. Lisa began running Wild Press and Rise with the belief that we can change the world through story. And my understanding is they're still accepting uh, submissions, but they've got their publishing grid out to like 2026 at this point. So she'll tell you how to submit next month while you're in the meeting. That's it. Okay. And Clay, is there anything you'd like to plug or let us know about or you know, anything um, of interest that you want to say? No, uh, if you if you want to learn more, there's always Killer Nashville. You could, you know, um, we'd love to see any of you guys at Killer Nashville. Um, and you can learn more about that at killernashville.com. If you want to know more about me, claystafford.com. 
And I think with those two, um, two links, you can get just about anything that you might want. I'm not big, Howard, I'm not big on plugging. So I love, okay. I love sharing, but I don't, I'm not. Big on <laughs> well, that's, that's a good way to look at it. <laughs> okay. And again, we thank you for uh, being with us and being so gracious to give us your time. Well, should I, let me ask you this, uh, they, uh, Michelle, um, you, you said that you're going to keep the Zoom open. Should I stay around for any kind of questions or interaction or people talking about their own projects or should I just go ahead and go? Um, you are more than welcome to stay. We're not going to shut you out. So, well, no, I didn't mean shut me out. I just, I, I don't want to interfere with everybody else's conversations though. If they have like thing, you know, like personal things they wanted to talk about or something, I don't want to, but I'm, ha but I, I'm I think you can probably hang out in the meeting as long as you'd like. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm here. If anybody has any questions about your individual project. Anybody, anybody in the room? Hmm. Nope. Okay. Thank you all for coming.